Good evening, good evening, good evening, podcast family, and to those out there who just feel like listening to some good old bird gang chat, welcome to another edition of Birds of a Feather. I'm your host, Suburban Princess, AJ, how you doing? I'm just here basically trying to hype myself up amidst this head cold that suddenly came upon me within 24 hours. Uh, the weather's being crazy as usual. We're still kind of on the tips of like Indian summer, borderline winter. So my body's just having a field day up in my head. And I don't understand why even the tussin, the tea, you know, orange juice is not enough, but you know, just things you got to go through. Welcome back to episode 16. I'm very excited for tomorrow night's game, Seahawks versus the Eagles, because not only because this game is in Seattle, which is very loud and their audience is called the 12th man, but I basically feel like this is going to truly, truly, truly show, or at least the beginning of proving that the Eagles have gone through this whole season as well as the off season you know, how he's been signing people on and off. We want to see if now, if it's going to come to fruition, we're going to see now if maybe this 10 and one record they currently have is just a fluke. Have they just found the right time to peak being that it seems like every other team is either losing a major part of their squad or they're just not good enough when the Eagles play them. Um, It pretty much is one of those years where it seems like it would be going the Eagles way, but you still have the arguments out there, whether it be social media, Twitter specifically, that um, choose to look at the Eagles as not playing anyone challenging yet. Now, I beg to differ because there's been some weeks in the first five weeks that they could have seriously lost some games. But the one thing I think that even non-Eagles fans admit and will have to cop to is that the Eagles never not come back. They never not rebound. They always seem to find a way to make that last uh, minute and a half count. Um, they don't stop playing until it's 0-0. Zero, zero. And I love the fact that now that we've added even more players and as of literally last night, they locked up Alshon Jeffrey, wide receiver, uh, for four additional more years. So it's a good thing because Carson does find him a lot. And uh, unfortunately, with with, uh, Jordan Matthews being traded to the Bills earlier this year, you thought that Carson would never get that chemistry back with somebody. And uh, him and Ertz have been working out fine. And Ertz was extended earlier this year, so that was good. But I do feel like that the consistency issue was always the reason why the Eagles could never get on a proper footing. Even when they were having a good uh, string of wins, there was always something that came through that pretty much put them back on their back. So I feel like that, I feel like that lull that we're all waiting for to come, the shoe to drop, it hasn't happened yet because the Eagles have made it a point to consider, to consistently try to win games. And I think that's something that's been missing since the year before the Super Bowl, if not uh, the year after. So I really am not worried about this game, but I will not be shocked if they drop one in Seattle because there's a lot of factors that could go against them. Yes, the Seahawks have missing ha- are missing key defensive people like Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor, but they still have other offensive weapons and Doug Baldwin. Um, they have two other receivers, Lockett, Richardson. Um, I forget the other one. Um, Earl Thomas, I think, is still back in, which I thought he was injured, but he could be a factor if uh, Vi has another bad day. Um, I'm not expecting a fast start. I'm expecting the Eagles to sputter like they normally do in the first because they got to feel their way with a new team that they haven't practiced with or um, haven't seen since last season, should I say. And I'm sure film is deceptive, especially when they might have had their full squad last year as opposed to now. And uh, there were just a couple games last year that even in Carson's first year, they could have won, but they somehow could not close the deal. So I think the difference between that team and this team is definitely that they know how to close the deal. I mean, the Denver game, they pretty much had it sewn. In Dallas, they sputtered in the first half, but then the second half, it was almost like it was a new game. So I I find that even the moments that you think they're going to drop one, there's just a, there's just a special look that Carson can get, whether it be strategically or in, in his eye 
or if it just clicks in with everybody that we are not going to go down. You know, we're going to try to keep this winning streak running. And so next thing you know, give them a couple more minutes in in the fourth quarter or third quarter and, you know, boom, they're off and running. So I think if we see that lull during the Seahawks game for longer than a quarter and a half in the second half, I'll say, I'll say that about a quarter and a half in the second half, if they're still kind of having this slow uh, approach to adjusting, then I'm going to be a little worried. Although I'd rather have them drop it now and then and then like slaughter the Rams because me, I'm more excited that I'm going to actually go to an away game, but I physically won't be in the building now because I waited too long to get tickets. So um, the fact that I will be in California, even in in the vicinity of a possible Eagles win without being in Philly is going to be a wonderful feeling. So I'd, I wouldn't mind going to LA knowing that I'm going home with a win, you know, in my head. So I hope for their sake, since they're going to be spending the next two weeks on the West Coast, I hope that they're able to come home feeling even more confident than when they left, um, if that's possible. Because at this point, I feel like there's nothing that could go wrong with them, but yet everything can go wrong. Um, there's a lot of jinxes. There's a lot of crazy things that have been said from other people that are jealous from other teams, you know, fan wise. And, and then there's, there's, there's the players who really at this point, some of them, I don't even think really even want to smack talk the Eagles because they know, and everybody knows that we have been due as fans to have some, some, some kind of a consistent success, especially in our other teams, even though the Flyers are struggling right now and they might have to do a coach change again, but you know, the Sixers are starting to find themselves and they're stored, they're still going through growing pains, but everyone sees the potential and the promise of very good teams in the future. And that's all that we fans have wanted and needed for years. So I personally am one of those females that likes to see the positivity, if not in my sports teams, but I like to believe that they're not going to be this team that's going to decide to wait till the playoffs to start acting like they don't know how to play football. Um, If anything, I do see that the future is going to be bright, but I also see it. There's going to be some questions because some players are not going to be able to stay on the squad. There's just been a lot of one year contracts and there are a lot of extra guys that we just needed just to get through the season with that may not transfer over to 2018. Now, with Alshon just getting signed within the last 24 hours, it's definitely clear that Carson has his usual suspects still in offense. But there are still some players that have been suffering injuries and have been on IR that we have to worry about never seeing again. You know, will this be Jason Peters last year? Will he decide to retire? Will Sproles even bother coming back? Or will he just sit and just retire and just watch on the sidelines? Or will he try to fight one more good year in him and then just try to finish a year with the Eagles and hopefully another playoff run? To me, it really all depends on how they do. Come January, February, I'm praying that that answer will kind of take care of itself. Um, I'd like to keep Sproles just as a good utility veteran backup, but I understand that, you know, he would be kind of tapping the cap and tapping the salary when they could be spreading the love around for people who just got here or maybe deserve a couple more year more in pay. So it's a good thing to be Howie in the sense that he made a lot of ripples work for him in terms of uh, adding to the success of this team. But that's also stressful for the front office when it comes to the new year because they got to figure out who's worth spending the money on and who's not. You can't always get that battle right. And I sure as hell am glad I'm not good in economics and good at, uh, you know, uh, calculus or any kind of uh, math skills because I wouldn't want to be the one to have to really sit there and plug numbers and hope that it won't make them want to walk into free agency without even bothering signing a contract. So. It's going to be a crazy off season, but honestly, the last three years since we've gotten Wentz has been the craziest of off, off seasons. And that's been more exciting, actually, than it's ever been. Because one, we never had the much exposure to off season stuff, you know, except for when they announced things back in the past. But now with social media, everybody knows any, anything. And, and who knows? I mean, they're not to creep into politics again, but we may not have the ability with the uh, internet being so loose in the future. They may decide, (laughs) the government may decide to put a a charge on that too soon. So maybe we won't have the exposure that we used to as fans to knowing everything and and being able to discuss everything on social media so loosely. Um, That may change in the new year too. And if that's the case, you know, a lot of us are probably going to be blogging a lot more and or just writing things and putting them in in uh, newsletters online. I mean, who knows? I mean, there's, there's definitely going to be ways that the news is going to seep out. It just may not seep out as fast anymore, which probably is a good thing, but it's not because I don't want to be charged for using something that I've always had the free will to use as much as I wanted. 
But we'll see. I mean, uh, now that the Senate just passed that bogus tax bill for the rich, um, there's also a huge investigation going on right now uh, in subliminal terms that might oust our president sooner or it may expose a lot of things that no one ever really thought. And it might not even matter that the bill got passed because it may em- may end up getting terminated if uh, they end up somehow impeaching the whole administration, which I just read that Congress can do. So I'm just praying that over 2018, we don't have to suffer through another three years of uh, GOP sabotage. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about that. Birds of a feather is about sports. So let's just jump back into it. So the Sixers, they play tonight. They play at 730, which is in a couple of hours. But let's be real. Um, their last stretch of games have been kind of questionable. They did play LeBron recently this past week. And yeah, it was a challenge, but it was also a game they could have won. Um, with or without Embiid, I think there's still a lot of growing pains that Embiid is going through. Um, I don't know if maybe that offseason, you know, giving him a lot of uh, downtime has caught up with him. And maybe that's why he seems a little bit discombobulated in between games. Um, But Ben, as great as a rookie and a talent that he is, I still don't understand why he still doesn't have a lot of versatility to his foul shots, if not jump shots. And I'm not a pro at knowing, you know, what is the issue and what his position was supposed to be when he first got here. But it's clearly obvious in the last game that they just played in, in Boston that Ben should really have a more uh, expanding role and everyone else underneath him is just not as good. But he also has not expanded his um, his basketball IQ to the point where we know that he can be be the next LeBron, be as well rounded, be able to to hit a three pointer on his own. I feel like he feels like he's good at being a passer, and I don't think that that's all he has is just being a dunker and a passer. We don't need Iguodala Part Two. We brought Ben here to be the multi-talented, well-rounded player that everyone's saying he is. So I'm still waiting myself as a viewer to see what everybody's talking about. Because with Ben, it's obvious he's not the loud personality that Joel Embiid is, but he just got, um, on social media, got awarded that he was considered the rookie of the month. Well, it's December now. And at this point now, I want Ben to do more than just dunk and just be that guy that can pass behind the back or that guy that can maybe throw when he's right under the basket or pass under the basket and get the basket himself. I want to see more. And I think that when I listened to Mike Masinelli's show this past week, he kind of showed me that he's still disappointed in Ben's uh, lack of growth. Yet, I look at it this way. We didn't have him for a whole year. So I'm just glad to see the boy still playing. He got hurt toward the end of that Cavaliers game, but they said it was an ankle he might have tweaked or whatever, whatever. But he's back. So it wasn't even like he sat out a game for that. Um, Fultz, our rookie choice. Is really the big question mark because it still seems like no one understands why he never had the ability to shoot somewhat better than what he did. Now, mind you that it all came out now that he has some kind of weird, funky uh, issue in his shoulder that has to do with how his muscle is and how his, uh, I guess, rotator cuff or all that stuff is related. Something's wrong to the point where he cannot extend like he used to. Now, I don't know. I don't know how to be a scout. I'm not a basketball Nista in the terms of I don't understand how they stick out these guys and not know this stuff ahead of time. But there's a lot of behind the scene questions I have with the NBA that I don't understand. Um, these guys are supposed to be Svengali's are supposed to know what they're doing. They're supposed to have shown a lot of potential. But so far, we only had Foles, Foltz mostly in the preseason. And then even when he did play, it was kind of questionable as to why he does not seem to be able to follow through like he did when they had them, um, you know, doing preseason. Well, He's young. He's not even 21. So I feel like Fultz is just a project waiting to happen. So I I can hear the criticisms, but I don't think it's necessarily warranted for everything. Ben, on the other hand, has so much potential, but he's already in his early 20s. So I'm waiting for him to break loose like sooner than later, because I feel like all the hype that followed him from his LSU days is really what brought him to Philly. Mind you, I'm not a fan of hype. I do think that hype kind of sells everything short and it sets you up for disaster. And I, and I sometimes hate that about sports because, you know, their agents got to get paid and their agents got to, you know, show and prove that they uh, signed a star to a future NBA league team. But if they don't have the ability to pick up things in the off season during the preseason, all the reason why they hype people up a year before they even play, then that's kind of a wonk wonk. That's a letdown. And I don't feel like as a viewer, we should sit through another year of guys missing shots that they shouldn't miss and then 
looking like they have the potential to, you know, move the ball effectively. But yet when some of them all play together, like Dario, for instance, sometimes they all get out of sync. And, you know, that was the issue I know that Nerlens Noel had when he was here and they started bringing all these other big guys in. Same with Jaleel Okafor. There's got to be a reason why he's sitting on the sidelines this long and not subbing for uh, Fultz or anybody else when they're injured when they don't have that big guy. So, and even though I love my Frenchman, Tibby Cabs, I, I don't see him uh, playing starting again or anything like that with the Sixers. I eventually see him uh, glued to the bench, if not traded. But he has grown a little bit from when I liked play, seeing him play last season, but I don't think he's going to be that breakthrough uh, player. Um, same with uh, Stauskas. You know, he was good. To, he was a good uh, place uh, playmaker. Um, he was also a good role player in the sense that, you know, he was supposed to be the three-point guy. Well, he would be very, very, very skittish. And he would be on when he wants to be and then off a lot more of the time. And uh, supposedly now Covington, who just got re-signed, uh, Robert Covington, he's supposed to be our three-point guy. Well, he's gone kind of blank in the last week. And I don't know if he's rushing. I don't know if he's just his concentration has just gone or his confidence may have dipped since he got signed. But he has to get out of that real quick, too. You know, he needs to do that more often because I think, again, that was probably the catalyst that would have got them to beat Cleveland. Um, everyone knows not to leave a lane open for LeBron. So sometimes those assignments were blown a lot. And I don't understand that, especially if you know how LeBron plays. Um, now that the rumors are recirculating again about the Sixers trying to get him for the future, I just thought that was stupid. I said, I don't want LeBron like in his later years. I want LeBron when LeBron started getting hot as a youth. Like if Eagles, I mean, if the Sixers had gotten him earlier, then maybe I'd be excited about LeBron coming to Philly, but I don't see him fitting in here. And I don't, I see him being like a Donald, a Donovan McNabb type character, you know, especially because sometimes he's so freaking dramatic when he drops to the ground, when he gets hurt, when he gets hit, he's just really, really dramatic. And I think that he has tendencies to be, um, like Don McNabb, like whiny, privileged, you know, not saying he doesn't work hard and Donovan worked very, very hard, but I do think there's a point where someone like him, he tends to lax when he feels like it. And, uh, he feels like his, his prolific, uh, career has earned him that. And granted, you know, he's got a family, whatever, but I do also think sometimes he expects things to go his way and Philly ain't trying to hear that. So I don't see him blending with our team at all. Um, I like the fact that, you know, guys on our team, you know, look up to him and admire him, but I don't see him fitting in on the Philly team, especially because the bigs that they have drafted thus far on this team still need to get chemistry with each other at the same time, as opposed to just sitting and watching the other play and that person getting used to playing. But then when they put Embiid back in there, you know, will he vibe with Dario? Will Dario vibe with just, with just Ben and him and Bayless? You know, Bayless is not going to be there long because he's kind of horrible. <laughs> I think he has moments where he has great flashes of, potential and hitting from the three pound hitting the three point uh, basket here and there but I do not see him being a long uh a long a long time standing sixer I really see him being just kind of another role player like uh, Stauskas and just eventually they're going to bandage everything up and then trade it and ship it to somewhere else so um it's just a matter of time I feel bad for Okafor because I would hate to sit there and watch my dream fester especially when I don't really think he wanted to come to Philadelphia so I think part of it was I, I was the good guy. I didn't, you know, have an attitude. You know, I didn't talk badly, but he is dropping hints now that he really would like them to just work something out and get him out of there. But you don't do it that way. You have to continue to be good. It's hard, but you got to continue. And I think at this point, everybody has now started to see it and they've started to feel that Okafor is just being played. And I really think it's they're waiting for the right deal. I don't think he has any value, though. I don't think he's given enough of uh, a showing in the past two or three years that he was a sixer that he deserves to be on a better team. That, to me, is the only reason why he's stalling in finding a a good deal for him because I don't secretly think that he has any clout to be able to have somebody put that money up. Now, I could be totally wrong. I mean, stranger things have happened. It is almost the end of the year. Someone could decide we'll take a risk on him and, you know, they may ship like four or five players just to get them over there, just to get one player back on our team. So I don't know. I mean, straight, like I said, just like the NFL, you cannot predict. I don't know how pushy they are in, in the office for um, new talent like they apparently have been this year for the Eagles. But um, 
you know, Colangelo has a lot of things to think about. And I think that if he isn't careful, he may sit on something. And then when everything blows up in the off season, you know, the front office might get another makeover. So we'll see what happens. Um, again, not a, <laughs> not a ball nista, but I know what I see. And, and, and I, I get excited for Ben and Joel to be playing sometimes, but I'm not a fan of resting Joel every other game. I wish he could just play for two, three nights straight and then rest. But either way, he and himself even admitted he didn't see himself playing all 80-something games. Obviously, he realizes his his legs and his knees are a factor. I think it's because he's freakishly tall. And I think just like my beautiful niece Alexa is at 14 years old, his knees will always be a problem. Um, he grew faster than his body would allow. And so I think that e- even him being in his young 20, uh, young 20 age, I think that Embiid has a lot of potential, but his body limits him to how long he can stand or last, you know, with friction and conflict on the, on the, on the court and still, uh, produce good, uh, product. He is a very good center and he has the potential to be even better. But again, if his body permits him from doing it, we can't control that. And it's just, uh, just our luck as Philly fans to suffer through another project. But, I don't know. This year has showed me that you, there's every reason to be patient with the Sixers because I feel like they have a product you can exactly, you can actually watch. And I would rather go through the process with this team than any other team at this point because, let's face it, we have been long-suffering fans and I feel like we've waited long enough for the big pal to come and if the Eagles give it to us sooner than we expect, I'm happy for it. I'm happy for the city. Um, as a female, I want to move over to discuss... That we have, we are in the middle of a year where, well, not even towards the end of a year, where we as women, especially women in sports, and I don't know, women in general have been, I don't know, put through the fire, put through the ringer for being interested in sports on any kind of level that takes them seriously. And if there's anything I'll never forget this year after the end of 2017, seeing some of these female uh, producers, uh, directors, weathermen, um, police officers, congresswomen, everything that a woman was told or probably was thought to never be able to accomplish in terms of position. Um, we've seen it um, sacrificed. We've seen it challenged. We've seen it questioned. And, you know, yes, we are in a world now where it just seems like there's no sacredness in anything. I think that we should all as fans appreciate each other and appreciate the girls that really understand their football. I was shocked the other day when um, Anthony Gargano said on uh, 97.5 in the morning that he said there is everything wonderful about women who know stuff about football. And I, for one, always thought that he was one of those guys that secretly hated women in football. But Anthony actually gave it props and said, I love when a woman talks football. I like when she understands her game. And I, I feel like, and I'm quoting there, I don't know exactly what he said, but he basically had said that he, he gave women props for knowing their sports. And I feel like that is not a general uh, consensus amongst men who have loved football for years or love any kind of sport. And I think secretly men are always challenged knowing that women can kind of straddle the fence. They can kind of be their female selves, but also know just more about the one thing that the men holds dear <laughs> And that's now you got women with who fix cars for the girls auto clinic. I mean, now that's a huge thing. And the founder of that um, organization, thank God, because now that they released this uh, kind of like a handy guide for women who don't understand cars, it showed me, okay, yet another thing women are starting to excel at that men could never fathom them doing. I think if anything, 2018 is going to show now that there should be no reason for men to question anything that women are in, especially in positions of power. Um, If anything, we save their asses. And I think that especially even with Hillary Clinton not winning the election last year, it showed me that we are still a far to go as a woman. But you also have to mind you, you have to be mindful as the woman to surround yourself with winners. And if you're not surrounding yourself with winners, as well as being a winner yourself, there's not exactly that strength of foundation. And I think that's why Hillary Clinton lost. Um, besides the fact that I do not think she's a personable candidate. Yes, I love the fact that she was a woman and she was willing to run. And I did support her for that. But I'm at this point now where I just want somebody in the presidency who actually does not prove himself to be uh, uh, self, self-preservating, self um, um, degrading the other people who he supposed to represent. And I expect him to be a proponent for humanity and not just men, women as well, obviously. And I think in this world, especially with sports, politics has seeped in more than we wanted it to. 
But now that the whole thing with the Players Coalition and Malcolm Jenkins, as well as all the other players who joined him in the fight to struggle to get social reform, not only out on the field, but outside the field, off the field, I think that the latest hubbub with that that has come out now with some of the players not being cool with the fact that the NFL is not willing to fund uh, social organizations themselves out of their pockets, but they're willing to um, reroute the money from already supported uh, organizations that they they go behind, like breast cancer and uh, prostate cancer and all those things that they support autism. They're not willing to come out of their pockets and do extra stuff for the obvious underprivileged teens, whether it be urban's, urban youth, law, you know, refugees, immigration, whatever it is that have been the hot topics this year. Um, kind of pissed some players off and they felt like it was a lost cause. Well, I say, look at it this way. They started the conversation. I don't know any players on any team that really would give a crap to go to capital, to go to the, yeah, the capital and, and sit with, uh, owners and put them on the, put them on the, on the board as saying, you know, we want you to take accountability that there are other things that reasons why we play football. You know, some of us need that platform. And I feel like now this is more time more than anything when Colin Kaepernick decided to kneel. It was to draw attention to things that are not fair for his culture and his people. And his people became our people because we are the people that support the NFL. And so I think those players recently that came out against Malcolm Jenkins thinking that he didn't really stand for anything and he decided he's going to stop protesting. They made it seem like he did that all for show. And now there's some of them are turning their backs on him. So I look at it this way. <laughs> Eric Reed from the 49ers was one of those specific people. I'd like to think, hey, you do you. This was not the point. The point was to draw attention to it. Now we want action. So I don't have to hold my fist up anymore because now I know that there are people out there who are listening to me and who will look at these players differently in a year from now and say, okay, I'm not going to just run the ground. I'm actually going to give a darn about his, his cause. And little by little, the NFL decided to not <laughs> promote breast cancer that much this year, I noticed in October, but they decided to give the players an opportunity to wear their support, their love, their organizations on their cleats. They call it my, my cause, my cleats. So yes, the NFL is a big, huge organization, triple billion dollar business. They are not going to take the money out of the white man's pocket just to throw it at some kids for NWCP or any of those underground organizations because they don't care. But if it wasn't for Malcolm Jenkins and some of those players that decided to physically put themselves, you know, on a weekend in D.C. and discuss something that probably was never challenged towards the owners and ask them the question, how can you help? I think it's time that you should. Colin would have been an issue if y'all had would just decide to ask him why he was kneeling as opposed to blackballing him. We just want to hold your head to the fire. So the ones who don't support it don't get it. And those fans who are offended by it don't get it. And this is the problem when you decide to protest. Protest does not actually bring a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. It challenges people. It gets people riled up. It invokes, it evokes emotion. And um, it basically gives a platform to what's unjust that needs to be fixed. And so that is never going to be comfortable and that's never going to have a red bow tied around it. And it's never going to always make everybody comfortable. So those who don't feel like him, as well as other people who fight, people who protest in the middle of streets and busy rush hour, that is the point of a protest. So why protest if everybody just thinks it's a way to look, um, look important when it doesn't do anything? And I think that the people who still feel like they need to kneel, they shouldn't be looked down at either because I know it's not going to stop the kneeling. I think Kaepernick did something that everyone would have never thought to do. But again, we find out later that Marshawn Lynch was sitting the whole time and nobody filmed him. So if anything, I hope this time next season, they won't feel the need to keep scanning through the audience to see who's standing it because it won't be a point to it. The point is the battle is on there. The conversation is out there. And now people are going to actually question things. That was the point. And so as I close this episode of Birds of a Feather, as we await Sunday night game of the Birds versus the Seahawks, I say go birds, but I also say go fans, go bird gang, go to everybody who loves sports, loves it honestly with their heart and soul, and they're not willing to go to such extremes to create opposition. It's just friendly banter when we go team against team. But at the end of the day, know that it all comes down to your love of football. 
And that's all I wanted to project with my podcast tonight was just get hyped for the game. Be mindful. There's a lot of factors out there that could prevent the W, but I'd like to think that the Eagles will win 24-17. I do see this being a close one. I heard that the weather might be a factor. So it, I don't see a blowout. I don't see high points. I just see the Eagles like squeaking by with not a touchdown, if not a touchdown and a, and a field goal. So there you have it. Enjoy it, guys. And uh, like I said, think about what I said toward the end of this podcast. Just try to consider that not everything is about, it's not always about you, put it that way. Some things are about us. And football is an inclusive sport. And team, there is no I in team. So just know as a fan, you know, there wouldn't be no me if it wasn't for you. And we all bond on our love of football. So with that, I say, go birds, bird gang for life. See you later on the next podcast when I will discuss, excuse me, I will discuss the birds win versus Seattle Seahawks. Enjoy your weekend, guys. Good night.